will be in Second Chronicles chapter 7. If you'd like to turn there. I want to begin this morning by sharing with you a handful of quotes, <clears throat> words from some of our founding fathers and presidents. <clears throat> George Washington, at the Constitutional Convention of 1787, said, and I quote, It is impossible to rightly govern without God and the Bible. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail to the exclusion of the religious principle. Benjamin Franklin. (coughs) He who shall introduce into public affairs the principle of primitive or basic Christianity will change the face of the world. Patrick Henry. It's called Patrick Henry. Give me liberty or give me death. Well, he also said the Bible is worth all other books which have ever been printed. Noah Webster, who gave us Webster's Dictionary, also one of our founders, said the religion which has introduced civil liberty into this nation is the religion of Christ and his apostles. This is genuine Christianity, and to this we owe our free constitution of this government. Thomas Jefferson, often blamed for the whole separation of church and state issue, but let me tell you exactly what was his thought on the matter. Jefferson said the reason that Christianity is the best friend of government is because Christianity is the only religion that can change men's hearts, and that is necessary. President Barack Obama in Turkey early April of this year said, We Americans do not consider ourselves a Christian nation, but a nation of citizens who are bound by a set of values. Those values, Mr. President, are Christian. The foundation is Christian. The support of this country, whether we want to admit it or not, whether we think we've grown beyond it or not, is Christian. And by the way, just to be fair, I'm reading a, a book right now I'd highly recommend to you. It's called Inside the Revela- Revolution, dealing with the Islamic Revolution beginning in Iran back in 1979, and all that has happened across the geopolitical world in the last 30 years. And what has really changed the face of the world in terms of radical jihadism and what's really going on in the Middle East, both negative and positive things. Fantastic book, very well researched. But there's a direct quote, and I don't have it before me, but of President George Bush in there, where he says unequivocally that the God of Christianity and the God of Islam are the one and same God. We have strayed from some principles, not politically, not along party lines. We as a country have strayed from some principles which are absolutely undeniable going back to the founding of this country. There remains, thankfully, a significant population of Jesus-loving people in America who are praying for a revival of such values. Who are praying and asking the Lord to give us the heart to return to the values that started this freedom off in the first place. Remember, Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Paul said, it's for freedom that Christ set us free. Don't return again to a yoke of slavery. But with all that in mind, and I don't want to burst anyone's bubble, but a prayer for revival in America is a prayer that God may not grant. Nor is He required to, regardless of our evangelical passion and fervor. Let's pray for a moment and I'll explain what I mean. Holy Father, we come before you this morning and we pray, revive our hearts. Revive our hearts to do your will, O God. To live for you. To be purposed to do what you have asked us to do. 
Lord, the call that is on our hearts that is so obvious, and that is to tell people about Jesus. May we be a people who are constant in the sharing of Christ Jesus in this world. Who is our hope. Who secures our faith. Who teaches us how to love, Father. We pray that you would revive passion in us if that passion has waned. That you would instill in each of us, in this body and in your larger body, Father, a desire to live for you in such a way that we would be known as people of Christ. That people would understand and see the difference in a life lived by faith in Jesus. Values, Father, and morals. But beyond that, that living hope that sustains us day in and day out. The joy that is difficult to even explain. The peace that passes understanding. These things, Father, that are in the character and makeup of the believer in Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit. May this fruit be seen in and among us. Not so that we would be glorified in any way, Father, but that your fruit would be seen in us, that people would praise you. In the same way they praised you when they saw Jesus walking in the flesh. That we would live lives in such a way that people would take note and they would praise our Father in heaven. For this we pray, Father. And we greatly desire to be instruments of your kingdom. Those who are calling out, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the king is soon to return. This morning as we consider such things, Father, I pray. I pray that you will assign each of us to our role. Call us out, Father. From the longest term believer among us to the person maybe this morning who is just considering Christ for the first time. Call us forward to the next important step of our lives that we might, Father, shine for you in this world and be reflectors of your glory. Holy Spirit, teach us today in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 12. The Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. They're at the temple now. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. <coughs> Excuse me. The majority of Second Chronicles contains only cursory mentions of the kings of northern Israel. The kingdom of Israel. For very quickly, once we get beyond the life of Solomon, the kingdom will divide Israel to the north, Judah to the south. Two kingdoms rather than one, not unified, but divided. And in these opening chapters, we see this unified kingdom. Originally under David, but now at the beginning of Second Chronicles under Solomon. But that unification will quickly change. Solomon's son, in the very next generation, Rehoboam, decides to rule with a heavy hand and the people rebel. And the ten northern, uh, northern tribes, they break off under Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who leads them in rebellion and ultimately into abject idolatry. So the emphasis of the chronicler is on the royal line of Judah and not on Israel. If you want to read about the kings of Israel and their massive failures, you can do that in the books of 1 and 2 Kings. But in 2 Chronicles now, it's mainly, primarily Judah. The only time the kings of Israel are mentioned are in association with something a king of Judah is already doing. Why is this? Well, as we've talked about, the chronicler is tracking the line of Judah. Direct from Israel, Jacob, the son, his son Judah, who would be the royal family, given that honor, that privilege, and through that line all the way down to David, and on down from David, we end up with Jesus the Christ, the line of Judah, the messianic line. 
And that's what the chronicler is doing. He's showing us that line, that royal line. Remember, he's writing at about 400 or so, 420 B.C. So this is quite a bit later. And looking back at what happened, but it is a, it is a book of reassurance to the people of Israel. Messiah is coming. Here's the line of the kings. It is not over yet. And there's so many pictures and types and portraits of Jesus throughout First and Second Chronicles as well. But sadly, as we look at the kings of Judah, it's not a very pretty picture either. Twelve out of twenty of the kings listed are downright wicked. Only eight even approach being good. Of those eight, only five can truly be called outstanding in their rule. Five men, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joash, Hezekiah, and Josiah. Those five men I mentioned specifically because during their respective reigns, their generations in Judah saw revival in the land. The people truly, as the Lord said, the people who, who are called by my name, if they humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. And under these five kings, Israel saw that promise fulfilled as revival spread across the land. And the key word for Second Chronicles here is revival. That's the exciting thing about this book. And what we're going to see in in one story after another, we're going to come upon these great revivals and see what it was that stirred the heart of the people and how God called these five kings out to a time of revival. How do you bring about revival? I mean, in in a smaller form, this is something that pastors ruminate over constantly. How do we... And still passion into a people. How do you do that? How do you motivate people beyond just a Sunday morning where people walk home or drive home and they say, well, that was, that was good. You know, <laughs> I'm excited today. When's the game on? How do you get beyond, truly into the depth of the heart to where people get stirred and things begin to happen and change begins to truly take place and lives are saved? How do you get to that point? I mean, books are written about it. You know, church growth principles. How when a church hits 300, that's a, that's a bridge they have to get over. And then when they hit about five or 600, that's another one. They've got to get beyond that. And here are the principles and ways that you can force that or do that in your church. So I ask that question from time to time. How do we get there? And I ask you, do you personally pray for revival? And if you are praying for revival, what exactly do you mean? What exactly are you praying when you say, Lord, give us revival. Father, in the land. Heal our land. There are those who believe if we pray hard enough, long enough, and even loud enough, that the Lord will hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land, America. It might surprise you, but we're going to challenge that notion today. Prepare to be offended. Although, by the time we're done, I hope you're not. But I need to make one clear, unquestionable statement. God never promised to heal our land. Rick, we just read it. Hang on. God never promised to heal America. Never promised to revive in our country what our country started with. He never promised to heal our land. Let me ask you this. Are are we in agreement here this morning that God is sovereign? That He truly is King of the universe? That being the case, He is Creator and we are created. We are creatures. (laughs) Some more than others. He is the potter. And we are the clay. We don't give the orders to Him. We take our orders from Him. Amen? Amen? Romans chapter 9, verse 20, Paul said, Who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this? Will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay? A little side note, what Paul's saying is God made you exactly the way you are on purpose. There is a reason you are the way you are. With all your flaws and so-called defects, Things that you worry about, things you wish you could change, God says, no, 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 that's how I made you. And you may ask the question from time to time, well, God, why would you make me this way? And I think that's a good question to ask because the answer to that, the answer to that is, is, is where God shows you your purpose in life, why you are the way you are. Now, I'll give you one quick example and, and move on. This is really not my point, but I'm just thinking about this right now. God will create a person, I believe, who suffers from depression. 
What? Why would you do that? Well, we know medically. We know there are chemically, chemical differences in someone who's depressed. Why would God give someone that chemical difference in their life? I tell you what, what I've seen among people who have and suffer from depression is a great, deep compassion. So maybe that's what God's doing there. Maybe that you might have a deeper understanding for the pain or the hurt of others. However you are, recall this, know this, the thing molded doesn't answer, answer back to the thing, to the molder and say, why, why, why? You know, as if you blew it, you messed up. The pit in the avocado shouldn't be so big, you know. <laughs> he knows what he's doing. He made you as you are for his purposes. Ask him what that is. Find out. Now, again, it's not your job or mine to try to get the Lord to do something, to try and say, do it my way. It is the Lord who's trying to get us to do something, honestly. You might say, well, wait a minute, Rick. You're beating around the bush here a little bit. Get get down to it. Are you saying we shouldn't pray for revival? Not if we want revival to come. Huh? We shouldn't be praying... For revival, not in a traditional sense, if we truly want revival to come. You see, revival doesn't come when a people say, God, bring revival. Revival comes when a people humble themselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways. That traditionally is when God brings revival. Not when people are crying out for it, but when a people turn to their God and they repent for where they're at. And they, tip, they just seek His face. Not for any other reason, but to seek His face. To be for Him what He wants us to be. Whether that brings about any massive change or not in the world, this heart, this heart seeks to be just what He wants. And I believe that's absolutely key to revival. And we see it in the verses before us. Now, this is often quoted, Second Chronicles 7.14. It is a key verse. Printed. It shows up all the time. Every time you get online an email or a letter by mail or whatever calling for a national day of prayer, calling for the churches to unite and pray, 2 Chronicles 7.14, you can bank on it, is going to be somewhere on the letterhead. It's going to be placed right there. The problem with this is, gang, 2 Chronicles 7.14 is not God's promised prescription for saving America. It's simply not. In fact, there remains no biblical guarantee, you can't find it anywhere, that if the church in America, or anywhere else for that matter, rises up and prays that God will heal our land. You can't find it. So why have I seen this verse so often applied that way? Well, because one of the greatest mistakes in preaching today, a mistake that I've been guilty of myself, is confusing interpretation with application. And they are two very different things. The interpretation of Scripture, what it means, who it was for, why is it there? And the application of Scripture, okay, so what can I do with this, are two different things. And gang, the passage before us, especially verse 14, remains one of the most misinterpreted passages in all the Bible. So let's interpret it correctly. Go back to the passage and consider it in light of two things this morning. A literal interpretation. A literal interpretation, number one. What is the setting of what's going on here? This is the evening of Dedication Day. What's just happened in chapter 7, which is a repeat and it's more specific of what we read about at the end of chapter 5, is the temple is now dedicated. Solomon prays a great prayer. The people of of Israel are all gathered around the temple. It has been finished. It took seven and a half years, but it's complete now. The ark is brought into the temple, and we're told that when the ark is brought in and the priest set it down, the temple is filled with the Shekinah glory of God. Shekinah glory. If you want a picture of that, think of the cloud in the wilderness. Cloud by day, a fire by night. It was the same luminous cloud. At at night, when it got dark, they realized that cloud's on fire. And during the day, they could see the cloud. And this is the Shekinah glory of God, this, this representative glory of God himself, comes into the temple, fills the temple... So full, so incredibly, as we saw Wednesday night, that the priests had to get out. They could not stand to worship in there. They couldn't stay. It was just absolutely overwhelming. That's just happened. Solomon has dedicated the temple. They've offered sacrifice. The people have worshipped and praised. And that evening, 
the Lord comes and speaks these words. What is the setting? Dedication day for the temple. Which temple? The Jewish temple in Jerusalem in Israel. Not any or every temple placed throughout the world, but that particular temple. Who is God talking to here? He's talking to Solomon. This is a one-on-one conversation with Solomon. Critical question, who is God talking about? And the answer is Israel. Israel, the literal interpretation of this verse is God is making a promise to Israel. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Remember, the people of Israel are the chosen ones. Now, hold on. You you and I are chosen too, but separately, differently, uniquely. People of Israel are the chosen ones. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. And repeat it again in Deuteronomy 14, verse 2. Moses says, you're a holy people. Or a peculiar people. To the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. No other people group are like you, Israel. And this is not just a mosaic pep talk. Moses is speaking words of truth. Psalm 135, verse 4. The Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel, for his own possession. So what land is God promising to heal? The land belonging to Israel. Literal interpretation. He's promising Solomon, if my people Israel will do these things, will seek me in humility, will pray to me, will repent for their wickedness, I will come. I'll forgive them. I will heal their land, the land of Israel. And again, we're going to see this over and over throughout 2 Chronicles. That if the people do this, God responds. He comes. He heals the land. He brings forgiveness. Now, I've been asked before, when you talk about Israel, are you talking about the land or are you talking about the people? And it's both. The land gets its name from the people who own the land, who have the right to the land. Israel are the people, but unlike the church, which is not attached to any particular real estate, we're floaters, we're we're sojourners, we're just kind of wherever God places us. That's different. Israel has a land. They are connected intimately to the specific geography of the promised land. Verse 14, again, God clearly ties the promise to Israel, saying, My people, and more specifically, who are called by my name. My people who are called by my name. What exactly does that mean? Keep your finger in 2 Chronicles and go back to Genesis 32. Genesis chapter 32. I know it's a hard book to find in the Bible, but do your best. Genesis 32 and verse 24. And then Jacob was left alone. Jacob, Jacob's an interesting character in Scripture. He's a schemer. He's a deceptive guy. He's the one who stole his brother's birthright, kind of tricked him into it. And then, then went in... And stole his father's blessing by putting, you know, false hairy arms on. You know, which I wouldn't have to do. My my, uh, my new children have a lot of fun with the hair on my arms. Anna Marie wants me just to shave it off completely. Naomi just likes to pull them out, you know, piece by piece. But he faked it. He was a smooth-skinned man. He was a kind of a tent dweller, a a knitter, I, I think. He liked to stay indoors. His brother Esau was, you know, the big, tough, rugged outdoorsman. Esau, the firstborn, who would be the kind of person we'd look at and go, yeah, that's someone to build a people off of. Not wimpy little crafty Jacob, whose name Jacob means, as our own Jacob Crouch knows, heel catcher. And so here's Jacob at this point in his life, and he has schemed and, and gone back and forth, done all kinds of, you know, tricky things, and he's left alone, verse 24. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Verse 25. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh. So the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he was wrestling with him. And then he said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But he, Jacob, said, I will not let you you go unless you bless me. And so he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he, the Lord, says, because the Lord is the one who's wrestling here, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. 
For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. What's ironic about this is though Jacob won the wrestling match, it was only because God was limiting himself in the wrestling match. And the Lord shows Jacob this by, at some point in the night as they're wrestling, he just touches his thigh. And, oh, okay, game over, stop, I'm out. You know? And his thigh, he would have a limp for the rest of his life. As a reminder, in the flesh you strove with me. You may have thought you prevailed, but all I had to do was touch you with my finger, and it was game over. So the true power there is actually with the Lord, the name God gave Jacob. And here's why I take you here. And this name by which all those who come from Jacob's family line would forever be called is Yisrael. Yisrael. In the Hebrew, literally, God prevails. The name God gave his people is God prevails. The name Israel itself is prophetic. It is the summation of Israel's entire past, present, and future. God prevails. God prevailed over Jacob that night. God prevailed in Israel as he led his people out of Egypt. God will prevail again in the future when he restores his people completely to their land. God prevails. When you speak the name Israel, it is the name of his people who are called by his name. Yisra prevails. El, speaking of God. El, the, the Hebrew word for God. God prevails. Isaiah 63, verse 18 says, Your holy people possessed your sanctuary for a little while, but our adversaries have trodden it down. We have become like those over whom you have never ruled, like those who are not called by your name. And that has been the rocky history of Israel. I won't go into it. We've talked so much about it. There's been an up and a down and an up and down, and the people return to God and He heals the land. And then they stray from the Lord and they fall apart. But God prevails. Never miss that fact. God prevails. Well, why did God choose Israel instead of, you know, Greece or Rome or China or America? Why didn't God choose America as his chosen people? You know, early on in our country's history, that was one of the prevailing thoughts. Replacement theology at the time was very strong. And the whole idea that that the Europeans who came across were new Israel, were the real Israel, replacing, kicking out old Israel, was very strong in the psyche and the mentality of the people. And they came across, and as America began to grow in its freedom, the Judeo-Christian values flourishing, people truly thought, we are the chosen nation. And we are going to reign into the world peace and perfect prosperity. And here we are just a couple or so hundred years later, and how are we doing in the world today. The land referred to here is not America. Why did God choose Israel to reveal himself? Gang, for one thing, we learn so much. They, in watching God's interactions with the people, why did he choose the people at all? And so we could see in a microcosm what God wants to do in the big pictures. I'm going to show you, the Lord might say, what I desire of a people and how I interact and how I work with. And you can look at that from this point always. You can look at that and say, oh, this is, this is what matters to God. This is what's important to God. This is how he never gives up on a people. It's also through those people we know that we see him specifically in the person of Jesus Christ, who was born a direct descendant of the line of Judah, of the sons of Israel, Jacob. And Paul said in Romans 9, verse 4, To the Israelites belong the adoption of sons, and the glory and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and I love this line, and from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. Why did God choose Israel? Well, there was going to be some human family line through whom Jesus came. God looked at Israel. God looked at Abraham, this sojourner. Pulled him out of his country and stuck him in a place where he just traveled around his whole life. God chose even a location that that would be normally so insignificant in the world. And you look at the whole thing and say, see, I would have chosen Rome. My odds would have been better (laughs) for a, a great world power. I might have waited and chosen America. Because then you could truly reign in the kingdom with this people. But God chose a people who would be rebellious. He chose a people who were small. He chose a people 
who though they began in great glory under David and Solomon, would soon fall apart so that we would see His grace and understand more fully His nature because it's really not about Israel. It's about God the Father. His relationship with Israel as a people and a nation. It's a picture of the faithfulness of a father, even in light of the faithlessness of a people. And when it's all said and done, there will be a stunning realization upon the physical world and the spiritual realm that will ring into all eternity. God prevails. God prevails. Whoever He chooses, however He works, God always prevails. But we need to get this down. Again, in verse 14 here, the literal interpretation, God is promising to respond to the prayer of Israel to heal their land, not America, to heal ours. J. Vernon McGee said there were definite conditions that God put down for Israel. And their history demonstrates the accuracy and literalness of these specifics. And as I said, we're going to see this with five of the coming kings. Every time they humbled themselves, every time they prayed and sought Yahweh's face and turned from their wicked ways, the Lord responded in restoration and revival, and He healed the land. We will see this healing of the land fulfilled literally and completely in the coming kingdom as well. But listen, my friends. One of the greatest omissions of biblical prophecy... One of the greatest things that's excluded from anything we can find in Scripture, especially related to the end times, is a nation by the name of America. I mean, there I've found two verses in the whole Bible that might allude to the possibility, if you tweak them a bit, (laughs) of the presence of America in the last days. A mention in Daniel of ships coming from the west, although that could be anywhere, but hey, we're west, so maybe that's America. <laughs> and the two wings are given to the great eagle to, to save the people of Israel, Revelation 12, to lift them and take them into a place prepared for them in the wilderness. And some have thought, maybe that's a great American airlift, the eagle, you know, it's a symbol of our country. It was also the symbol of Rome, and I don't think they're airlifting anybody out. <laughs> and that's it. There is no specific reference to America, even at all, as present in the end times. That should tell us something. Wait, maybe it's just an oversight by God. (laughs) Maybe he missed it, and even now he's going, oh, can we throw another book in there at the last second? You know, the book of America? (laughs) Will America ever rise to great spiritual heights? Spreading the Christian worldview to all nations. Gang, this prayer is simply not a promise for America. If it were, we'd have to follow through, by the way, with verse 15. Because the Lord says, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer offered in this place. So if you want to pray for a healing of the land, you've got to go to Jerusalem and to Israel to do it. Now, if you want to sign up for the Israel trip, great. There's still lots of room. And I'd love for you to go. And prayer in Jerusalem is considered a local call. But, but it's obvious when you just read it as it is. And when I say the literal interpretation, we're not reading anything into it. We're not carrying our, our theological or our religious or our denominational baggage into this verse. We just read it as it is. It is a verse for Israel, about Israel, dealing with the land belonging to Israel. The prayer is for, and God's promise is to, the Jewish people in the land of Israel. And the truth is, gang, because of the absence of America in biblical prophecy, one thing seems certain, at least to me, and that is our nation must eventually become a non-player in the geopolitical world. I don't like that, but I think that is a guarantee. Because we're not Israel. The dollar... It's not looking good. And it may fail. But fear not. We may, as a country, diminish in power and influence on the world stage, but do not be dismayed. Remember, God prevails. I love my country, but as much as I love my country, I don't need my country to prevail. I like when we do. But I know God prevails. And my peace is not in how we're doing. My peace is in the fact that the Lord will prevail. J. 
Jesus said, John 16, 33, in the world you have tribulation. But take courage. I have overcome the world. The greatest influence on the entire geopolitical scene is Jesus Christ. And God prevails, and so I have nothing to worry about. That's the literal interpretation. The prayer is for Israel, not for us. But there's a biblical application. That's the second thing to note. First, we start with that. We recognize who it's for, what it's about, what does it say. And then we can move into the application of this thing. And there is a great application to us. There's an age-old adage that says all Scripture is written for us, but not all Scripture is written to us. I think that's a really good standard. It's all written for us. Every line of every verse is written for us, but not necessarily to us or about us. And once we've correctly interpreted Scripture, we can still apply it to our own lives, to our own faith, even as you might apply a balm or a salve to a sore or a wound. We can take Scripture and now say, understanding who it's for, what's the application? There is a great application for us this morning. God says, my people who are called by my name. My people who are called by my name. Well, that's Israel, but it's also you. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a person called by his name. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Paul writes, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who, listen, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession. Hey, wait a minute. That's what Moses said about Israel, right? Right? Because Israel is a people for God's own possession. But now Paul's saying, and so are you if you're in Jesus. As Paul writes over in Romans 9, 10, 11, you get grafted in. You become a chosen people. You become part of this great picture that God is doing. A people for his own possession. Literally a peculiar people. Look around. There are a few of you who are rather peculiar. (laughs) Praise God. You have been called out to be a peculiar person. Zealous for good deeds. I am part of that. I am part of a peculiar people called by His name, the name of Christ. And 11 Acts 11.26, it specifically tells us the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Christianos. Little followers. Little Christians. Little Christ. People who do what Christ did. Who follow after the way Christ was and is. Christianos. You see, though the interpretation is for Israel, the application of this prayer is for you and me. We can rightly take it and and apply this prayer to our lives. So quickly, let's do that. Three quick applications of this reviving prayer for you and for me as a people who are called by the name of Christ. Number one, we must resign our self-sufficiency. That is, humble ourselves. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, resign our self-sufficiency. A few Wednesdays back, we talked about this. Do you know what the measure of true humility is? It's prayer. Without question, the more prayerful a person, the more humble. I'm not talking about the person praying on the street corner so everyone can hear. I'm talking about the person who, like Daniel, would not stop praying even though he was threatened with his life. I'm talking about a person who goes to the Father and prays. Because that's where true humility is found. Why is that? Because if you're spending that much time talking to God, you know you don't have the answer. You know where the power lies, and it is not with you. It is resignation of the self-will in light or, or in favor of the Father's will. The opposite of humility is not pride. It's prayerlessness. A humble man, a humble woman is a prayerful person, recognizing their incredible need for the Lord in all matters. I have found the longer I have gone down the road in ministry, the more I've had to pray because I have no idea what I'm doing. Just want you to know that. Your senior pastor doesn't have a clue. So you better better hope that I'm praying or we're in trouble. I mentioned before, during communion, Solomon goes to Gabeon to offer sacrifices in 2 Chronicles chapter 1. Why did he do that? He didn't know where else to go. He's a 20-year-old kid who has been handed the greatest kingdom on earth at the time who has been offered the task of building a great temple for the God, the creator of all things, and before he can do anything, he's got to go pray. 
I don't know what to do, Lord. But so he goes and offers sacrifices. Psalm 34, verse 2 says, My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. It is time, gang, as a, as a body, as a family, to resign our positions of self-sufficiency and turn to Jesus. That's application number one. Application number two. It's a second healing application to our lives. Seek his face. We must resign our self-sufficiency. We must, number two, recognize His all-sufficiency. Seek His face. Look to Him. Look for Him. Doesn't the Bible say no man can see God and live? Exactly. So we die to ourselves. That we might live through Him. Colossians 3.1 Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. We must resign our self-sufficiency, recognize His all-sufficiency, and God says turn from our wicked ways. That is, we must repent of our sinful persistency. Repent of our sinful persistency. This is hard for a long-time Christian who's doing pretty well. I can pray for the thing I did last week that I shouldn't have done, but when I've had a good week, how do I repent of that? I mean, overall, I went to Bible study, you know, showed up at, at a men's group, I went to worship practice and I swept out the barn. I had a good week. I'm not talking about me there, but just make an example. Really good week. And so I can't really think of anything to repent of. So those who need to repent, we'll watch them come forward and repent. And that's great. And I'll be praying for them. But I'm good. No, you're not. We are all called to an ongoing repentance in our life. Daniel. It's the most godly man in all Scripture aside from Jesus. He is the only one, when you read the entire Scriptures, you cannot find Daniel doing a single thing wrong. I'm sure he did. But you can't find it. But interestingly, you come to Daniel chapter 9, and you find this godly man, this lover of the Father, on his knees, repenting for himself and his people. Repenting for all their sins collectively. He owns it. Daniel says, we, we repent. I repent for the sins of, for our sins, Lord. When I look at Daniel, I say, Daniel, if it was me, I would have been repenting for the sins of Israel. But you look pretty good, man. No. We have, gang, in our hearts a sinful persistency, a sin nature that would separate us from the Father, if not for the blood of Jesus. And we will. We have that persistent propensity to do the wrong thing. Even as far as the motives and the thought life that none of us can see in each other, but God can, we must repent of our sinful persistency. In the letters of Jesus Christ to his church, Revelation uh, Revelation 2 and 3, there is one written, a letter to a particular church that if we could see the envelope, it might look something like this. The Church of the Comfortably Lukewarm. P.O. Box 319, Laodicea, Asia. P.O. Box 319, Revelation 3, verse 19. Jesus says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Truly, Laodicea is a picture of the church in the last days. At least an aspect of the church. A lukewarm, fervorless existence. And the Lord would say, Repent, church. Repent, my people. Turn back to me. Acts 3, verse 19. Peter said, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Resign, the Father says. Recognize and repent. This is the application to our hearts and to our lives. Not so that He will heal our land. The promise to Israel. But so that we, a people who are called after His name, might be light in a very dark place. So that others will be healed and we ourselves will maintain that alignment with the Father. Repent, recognize, resign. We're going to do that. We're going to do that next Sunday. 
I was right here in my notes, right here, and, and I stopped. And I recognized it was the Lord stopping me and saying, okay, Rick, you've taught about it, you've got to do it. So next Sunday, I'm putting out a call to our entire fellowship to be a day of prayer. Next Sunday, there will be no sermon. We're not going to open the Word and study next Sunday morning. We're going to come in and we're going to worship together. We will gather as a fellowship around the Lord's table and we will pray. I don't know if we're going to break into groups or pray individually. How, I haven't thought it that far ahead. All I know is the Lord said, I want you to come pray. Now, I know the way we do things at the bridge is focus heavily on teaching in our Sunday morning worship time. But the Lord wants us to pray. And I'll tell you what, you don't have to come. In fact, I would prefer the only people who show up next Sunday would be those who are willing to resign their self-sufficiency, to recognize God's all-sufficiency, and to repent of our sinful persistency. If you have a heart to do this, you may go, oh man, does that mean I'll have to pray in the mic? No. Yeah, but does that mean I've got to pray out loud in front of someone? Not necessarily. Are you going to call us to the carpet and, and put us in an uncomfortable place? Hey, you know what? For some of you, it's going to be uncomfortable because you don't pray out loud. I'm not sure why. Do you talk out loud to your spouse? Talk out loud to your friends? Do you speak out loud when you go to the store and you've got to buy bread? Or do you walk up to the cash register and go... <laughs> Amen. And out the door. I know it's uncomfortable for some. But I also know what God said. I couldn't get around this. I was sitting there going, not preach? Really? It's not because I want to take a day off. I think you guys who know me well know that I love to teach. But God says, no, I want you to pause. Okay, and praying for revival is not the key to revival. But praying in humble resignation and praying, seeking the recognition of his face and turning in repentance from our wicked ways. These have always been the attitudes that precede revival, both in Israel and in the church. And if you do a cursory study of the history of revival, even in our country, you will see revival came when people were not looking for a big thing to happen. It came when people truly humbled themselves before the Lord and sought his face. So don't show up next Sunday expecting a big revival program. Expecting the lights to be flickering and the barn to be shaking and the spirit to be so present. Which is amazing. i got to bring my friends. Revival's happening. This is not a call to revival next week. It is a call to humble prayer. A call to submit ourselves to the will and purposes of God as a fellowship. To say, God, what are you doing and how can we be totally aligned with that? one last thing I'll leave you with this morning. I said before, I'm a patriot. I love my country. I still choke up every time I hear, oh, beautiful for spacious skies. I can't help it. It's just something about the melody and the words. It just nails me. And I miss the good old days when our nation's primary color wasn't green. It was red, white, and blue. I was just waiting to say that. (laughs) But I have to be honest with you all. I don't pray for revival. Not in the traditional sense. I don't pray for hype and excitement and spiritual electricity to run through people. I pray for revival in terms of people getting saved in large number. That I pray for. I pray for revival in terms of the church impacting culture and changing the landscape. That I pray for. But more than revival, I pray for return. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. Chapter 11 is that great hall of faith where many people throughout Israel's history are called out as pictures of men and women of great faith. And verse 8 says, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed. By going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs 
of the same promise. Verse 10. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Skip down to verse 13. All these, referring to the many people listed so far, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. American citizens, hear me, if you are a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a stranger and an exile on the earth for your true citizenship is not here. Those who say such things, verse 14, make it clear they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And it is not L.A., and it is not New York, and it is not Seattle. God has prepared a city for you and for me, and it is New Jerusalem. I am a citizen of that kingdom. I have a dual citizenship. I'm a citizen of America. I care about what happens to this country. But I am a citizen of a different place. I love, even David said this, 1 Chronicles 29, 15, he says, For we are sojourners before you, and tenants, as all our fathers were, our days on the earth are like a shadow. Are you praying for a better country? Do you recognize where your true citizenship lies? Are you crying, Jesus, bring us home, that where you are, there we may be also? Are you an American settler? Or are you a kingdom sojourner? For this I pray, that on our way home, we might have dramatic impact in this world, that those who right now have no citizenship other than an earthly one would join the great kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For all the great revivals of church history, I would still prefer to be in the actual, tangible, immediate presence of Jesus. I want to be where He is. When He calls, come up here, I want to go. And I want to be ready. Why? Because when I gave my life to Jesus, I immediately became a sojourner. I gave up my right to the land. I gave up my right to settle. And I connected with someone who wants me to come to an eternal city. May we be a fellowship who prays this way. In resignation, recognition, and repentance, all the while looking for His return. And we will do so next Sunday. And I invite you to be preparing your hearts through this week, prayerfully preparing to gather as a fellowship and to call out to the Lord together. The Father... We wait a week to give us time to recognize the importance of what is going on here. And I will add this, Father, if you want to come before next Sunday, that's great. We'll we'll just pray in person around the throne. But I pray you will prepare our hearts. God, I pray that prayer will not be a thing that causes discomfort. Unless it's discomfort that changes us and molds us after the pattern of Jesus. Father, draw us together next week to pray as Your people. And in the meantime, Lord, we lift You up. We humble ourselves before You. We recognize there is none other but You. And Lord, even this morning, we repent for our own wicked ways personally, We repent, Father, as a body, a fellowship, a church. We repent for the things we have done that may hurt others or may have failed you. Even that which we might not even recognize. And we repent for our land, our country. Father, we stand in repentance for a world that has fallen so far from you. And pray that you might establish in this place the call of salvation that will be heard throughout this region. In Jesus we pray. Amen.